The opening sequence of episode 39 picks up right where the previous one left off, with Kenny first teasing Levi for being short, which I took very personally, and then popping off with his ODM gear and anti-personnel gun thingies. Much like we talked about last time, all of these scenes of course immediately tell us that there is a pre-existing relationship between Kenny and Levi that seems to go even beyond what we see in the No Regrets OVA. This also marks a huge tonal shift with ODM gear guns now coming into the picture. We'll be talking plenty more about this as we get further into the episode and all the questions of morality that arise there, but it's another one of those things that I think you only realize once they are right in your face. It's kind of like what we saw with the coffee. It's a thing that exists in the real world, so we don't really think about it that much, only to realize that, wait, it doesn't exist on parody. And the same goes for these ODM gear guns. We've seen regular weapons pointed at people. I mean, Aaron almost got blasted in Season 1. But when Nifa is shot here, you suddenly realize that not once have we actually seen or even heard about any serious human conflict within the walls. This is going to sound very, very dark, I know, but gunfights and guns in general are just so normalized in media that I think it's just one of those things that you don't really even acknowledge, well, until this happens. This is also one of very, very few times in the series where Levi just loses it, with him screaming and throwing his blades at Kenny. If you look back at things like the Annie mission and their squad also being wiped out, there he grew more cold and distant. That pain was displayed through this impenetrable stoicism, whereas here it is unbridled rage. Whatever that Kenny-Levi relationship looks like, right away, it is safe to say that it is not friendly at all and most likely it's also very, very bad. As for the title of the episode, Pain, well, first off, same man, same. But in terms of just summarizing this entire episode, much like with Scream just a few episodes prior, I think Pain fits very well. We have emotional and psychological pain with the likes of Levi, Armin, John, Historia, and even Mikasa. And we have a lot of physical pain with Jell and Nifa. Generally speaking, just about everyone is experiencing some sort of pain throughout this episode. And it's that pain that really moves the plot forward. For Levi, that pain propels revenge. For Jell, that pain makes him reveal the truth about Rod. And the same holds true for just about everyone from Erwin all the way to Armin. Moving into the episode itself, make sure you are sitting down because it is time for us to finally get into the legendary Kenny chase sequence. First off, in case anyone was wondering why the final season took so excruciatingly long to be animated and was split up into a frankly amusing number of parts, according to the legendary man himself whose name I just don't want to try to butcher, this single sequence took about a month to produce. So let us all just bow down to the eye candy that are the Levi scenes produced by the king himself. Also, side note, I mentioned this briefly last time, but this is where we see both Aaron and Historia be hit with tranquilizers, but when Aaron falls on top of Historia, we don't get any memory shenanigans. For the sake of not repeating myself, I addressed all of that in the previous video. Returning to Levi, though, the sheer amount of care put into this single sequence is just mind-boggling. In terms of story, we already get glimpses of Levi's past. I still distinctly remember having this moment of, wait a minute, so no regrets isn't what made Levi cold? Oh no. And now knowing how his story ends, this just stings a whole lot more. In terms of animation though, my absolute favorite part of this entire sequence is just how effortlessly it is framed. When Levi pops off, there is no high intensity music or anything like that. It's purely his mind racing through the possibilities while his body runs on pure instinct. Likely a mixture of his Ackerman lineage and of course just skill. But yes, the fact that the music is just this ambient guitar for like the first half of this entire thing is the biggest flex ever. <laughs> but saying that, the music does kick in exactly when Kenny appears. The only one who actually poses a true threat to Levi and causes him worry for personal reasons. Also, the way perspective is used here is nothing short of excellence, with it masterfully interweaving 2D animation with 3D CG backgrounds. And of course, because this entire thing is just the biggest flex ever, you can even catch scenes of Levi's reflection in the windows. And also note how the background for this scene is just this infinite side street stretching into a white void, which I think subconsciously just plants us in this claustrophobic entrapment where the only way is forward and the street itself is almost chasing us. Also, to quote the Corridor Digital guys who have also made a wonderful breakdown of the sequence, throughout this entire thing, I think it's easy to forget that in animation, there are no camera lenses or real perspective. 
All of this is hand-drawn. Everything you see here, every bit of warp perspective, every transition, all of it is by default deliberately crafted like that. When you get these swiveling shots of Levi pushing up against the camera, then we see him slide by as his head is grazed, which he completely ignores by the way, and then he spins right around to fall to the floor and spins around all over again, it's just masterful. As with everything on the internet, this is just one of those times that proves that the usual way CGI bad statements mean absolutely nothing so long as CGI is actually good. Stuff like this would just be impossible without it. I mean, it took a month as is. Can you imagine how long it would have taken if every single frame of the background was hand-drawn? Well, actually you can, because there is another sequence in Season 3 with a lot less CGI, also done by the same king, and that one took three months. Yes, a single small sequence took three months to produce. But no, 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 who am I kidding? I'm not going to shill for these companies, right? I am certain that MAPPA was just milking Attack on Titan. It's not like the final season, you know, had to be drawn or anything. No, 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 no. They were absolutely milking it, right, guys? I recently made the grave mistake on the internet of not disclosing sarcasm, so just in case, slash S. But the eye candy absolutely does not end there. Because we also get this really cool moment of the ODM zipline making these really cool looking circles through the air and then constricting to pull Levi in. It just gives his launch through the door even more oomph as we see his gear almost forcefully pulling him in. Also, the sideways landing on the thingy is always a W in my book. This is also one of those few times where a moment of comedic relief with the whole welcome sir in the midst of the tension just hits that perfect Goldilocks zone of slightly making you chuckle, but you are still on the edge. But story-wise, note how even now, the one and only worry for Levi is Aaron, Historia, and his team. Not for a second does he consider his own survival, the fact that he's going up against Kenny, the fact that there are a dozen other MPs encircling the building, or anything. His primary concern is still the mission. Though we then begin to get some exposition, with Levi talking about how he'd expect Kenny to be dead, only for him to fire back saying, oh, adults do plenty of things that kids like you wouldn't understand. Which, number one, immediately establishes a fatherly, or at least mentorship angle to their dynamic. And two, is of course another good old short joke which I again took personally. And he of course also very explicitly says that he never thought Levi would end up using any of the tricks he taught him. Again solidifying that there is plenty of Levi's story even before No Regrets. We've already talked about this plenty before in Season 1 with the Annie mission as well as with Season 2 in Historia. But it's with things like these that I think Attack on Titan really stood out in that it more so resembled the usual western ensemble cast type of writing instead of the usual small cast we see in anime and manga. Eren might be the main character, but yet again, for these first couple of episodes we barely see any of him. And if you recall season 2, right up until the wall sequence we get like a handful of scenes with him at best. I think there's a whole different video to be made around these differences in writing and how they might have impacted the reception of certain stories in the western markets, but I think all of that is better left for another day. Right now, I think it's just really cool that we get to see all of these stories with the quote-unquote side characters. Also, Gigabrain Levi using the bottle to see Kenny's reflection is really, really cool. And again, note how the music has now faded out completely and we once again get the cold standoff between Kenny and Levi. That is, until we see that it's not just them, the entire building is surrounded, and so that pulsing beat kicks in once again. You know that wherever you run, you'll find a bullet waiting. Though as Levi pops off, using one of the dudes as an anchoring point for his ODM gear and then a human shield, these drums kick in as he just pushes on with no hesitation and just slices a few more dudes. And also, like we talked about last time, it's here where Mikasa reveals what Levi said, saying that now it's not just Titans, now they'll be fighting people. Which, of course, carries the double meaning of the Titan shifters being declassified and, well, being people, and now us fighting against our own people in the MPs and the Crown. Though a smaller thing I love here is how clueless the MPs are. The dudes are just like, oh, they're running exercises, well, anyway, we've got paperwork to do. It's a battle happening in plain sight. It's so blatantly obvious that people just ignore it. Like, oh, the first interior squad's flying around the city? Must be some exercise. Their stature is just so high that people genuinely turned a blind eye to it. Which also may or may not be another parallel to the wider story going on. The walls as a whole are sort of turning a blind eye to the obvious truth of, well, Titans within the wall and the mass censorship going on with anyone pursuing the truth. 
Practically speaking though, remember how at the end of Season 1 we heard about the ODM gear clearance and all that? So anyone using ODM gear here must have had the clearance to do so. It's just so in their face that, like, it just must be legit. And we of course also get our first very cryptic line from Kenny about getting closer to his dream. Also telling us that there is more to him than just getting a big paycheck or working for someone else or anything along those lines. All of this is merely a ploy to get the Founding Titan and to see the world like Yuri did. To reach this pinnacle point of having power without power, if you will. Though as we cut to Jean and the others finally catching up to the carts, they see Levi, who's already going in for round 2 against the MPs. And I think it's here where this episode really shifts in its themes and embraces the horror of killing their fellow man. Something that I think is perfectly conveyed through Levi's unrelenting rush without a moment to think, and us then getting this moment where we can actually reflect on what just happened. Just like with the wall sequence, it uses the medium itself to plant us in the headspace of the characters. And also note how Levi hasn't said a single thing about this being gross or anything like that. Half of his face is still covered in blood, and he still hasn't even given it a second thought. If you recall our first ever scene with Levi, his first words were that he is disgusted and then he proceeds to clean his blades. But when he held his fellow soldier's hand, he didn't even think about the blood. His germophobia might seem like a quirky little character detail, but just like with Sasha and her food obsessions, when you notice it and what it does for the story, I think it elevates his emotions so so much because we can draw these direct comparisons. He'll get super mad about Aaron not having cleaned fast enough, but he will also fly through MPs and drench himself in blood to make sure Aaron survives. And returning to that point of putting us in the headspace of the characters, note how when we cut to Jean, he is, just like us, watching Levi just yoinking people with his ODM gear hooks and slicing them up one after another. This whole fight sequence is Levi solo. We share in Jean's bewilderment about everything going on. So when Levi suddenly yells out that these guys are trained not in combat against titans, but people, we too have this moment of, wait, things really did just change. Nifa wasn't a one-off and Kenny isn't just a bad dude. All of this revolves around the crown. Much like with the guns themselves, I think it's just a matter of explicitly spelling it out that I think hits really really hard here. Especially with Jean just being scared out of his mind. And speaking of being scared out of their minds, while Levi is still soloing everyone, Jean gets the jump on one of the MPs but clearly wavers and is immediately disarmed. Yes! And on that very cheeky fake-out death, which I won't lie, absolutely got me on my first watch, we jump on over to the mid-cards telling us about the anti-personnel gear. Much like with everything we've been talking about today, I think this too just marks a major tone shift in the series. Thus far in the series, everything in these mid-cards was telling us about the world behind the walls and of course plenty about humanity's fight against the Titans. But suddenly, we have an entire one detailing weapons designed to fight other humans. Not weapons that can harm humans, but ones deliberately designed to do so. In many ways, I think it can be likened to something like an apocalyptic story. In the beginning, it is always about banding together and fighting against the apocalypse itself, be it zombies or a lack of resources or whatever else. But in almost all of these stories, you have that point where people begin to turn on each other. And so, you have that huge breaking point. This is just setting up that idea, only to blow it right open with the basement reveal and of course all of Season 4. Returning to the episode though, we cut on over to the throne room where we basically see a council of evil dinosaurs talking about evil things. Okay, jokes aside, with us still being early in the season, this is kind of one of those pseudo-recap scenes. With us again being reminded of Nick's importance and the things he might have told the scouts, as well as them dropping a few lines about Erwin, which just plants the doubt that something might have already happened to him. Though the most interesting part here, I think is the just as we have been doing thus far parts. Clearly implying that there have been people who pursued the truth, but all of them were simply silenced. We get a few examples of this later in the episode, and we also get a story of the miner before. But I think it's just a nice bit of extra lore to lessen the sort of main character problem that a lot of stories have. While Aaron and the story we follow would be the first to break through that facade, it doesn't fall into the common pitfall of feeling like the world basically stood still before this story started. Many people did in fact try, but all of them were simply dealt with before they could do anything. The one we are seeing is merely the first one to break through. We then cut on over to Erwin and Niall, where yes, it is time to finally titrally overanalyze. In short, Erwin is just called on Niall as someone he knows quite well to discuss what's going on with the freeze on the scouts and all that. 
Later in the season, he'd of course also play a role in the entire coup d'etat Erwin had set up, so we'll get to that in due time. But here we see Erwin pick up a box of matches and light up a lantern, which I think is pretty clearly signifying the explosive truth that will light up the dark in the form of that fire and lantern. In the wider story, thus far, they've been wandering around in the dark, they don't know what lies beyond the walls and they don't know what hides in the basements. They don't know who their enemies are or what even the titans are. Erwin will light that lantern and find out. And in the Season 3 narrative, there is a shadow government lurking in the darkness. Erwin will light that lantern and expose them. And in Niall's story, Erwin would dispel that darkness that is this corrupt core and lead him to the truth in the coup d'etat. That's one deep lantern, huh? But wait a minute, Kuroto, that's not quite overanalyzing. Why yes, you're right, because this light right here also represents Erwin's light from a Titan point of view. And guess what happens next? Yes, he puts a cage on top of that light. You know, like the walls trapping the Eldians, all of whom have Titan lights inside of them. You know, that small thing burned in a cage. And you know how Erwin's entire story throughout Season 3 is confirming his father's hypothesis that they had their memories wiped by the Founding Titan? Well, the first thing that Armin says in the entire show, which is also kind of now sort of confirmed to be a retelling, is that on that day, mankind remembered that they are trapped like birds. Now that, my friends, is certified overanalyzing. As we cut on over to Armin and Mikasa, we just see him thoroughly emptying his guts. Here we have a bit of a cheeky subversion because you're first led to believe that he's puking just because of what he saw. Because don't forget, we left off on that fake out death. But it's of course not long until we see that, no, he is throwing up because of what he did. Remember what we talked about with the Red Swan? There is now blood on their wings and all that? This is that moment for Armin. I also think this is one of those moments where Attack on Titan really set it apart with some of these small moments of almost uncomfortable realism. He just killed someone, obviously he's puking his guts out. Sure, he's a trained soldier, but not one trained to fight people. He was trained to fight for people. And in the long run, again, Armin now too has blood on his hands. This time, that was pretty clearly self-defense. Next time, well, not so much. And another gut-wrenching moment of realism that we get here is him asking Mikasa, is this what it felt like back in the cabin? But immediately apologizing, clearly recognizing that even though he's doing bad, bringing up what happened to her is just not very cool. In terms of writing and moving the story along, those couple lines of dialogue really are necessary. But I think they are extremely efficient in grounding the narrative and making Armin's pain feel real. With his last words being just, sorry, I'm so sorry. It's this super raw moment of him just dumping his pain. Who is he apologizing to? Is it Mikasa for hurting her with that question and those memories, or is it the person he shot? Is it himself? Is it his parents? I think all of those answers are equally viable, and that's exactly what makes it great. It is a moment of just pure grief. And as we smash cut back to that shot ringing out, it of course all falls into place. Though my absolute favorite part in all of this is once again the music. It's not some intense chase beat or battle music or anything like that. Rather, it's a mixture of the now very familiar somber strings and then that usual horror-like sound effect. <laughs> At this point, I think a lot of you will already know how I am about leveraging complete silence or music that might initially seem Everything almost like it's out of last. place. It's just a really efficient tool to reframe the scene from a climactic battle to a hopeless chase. And of course, most importantly, as the title of the episode suggests, pain. But yes, with that, in what is at this point classic Aaron fashion, Levi holds back Mikasa as both he and Astoria are yoinked off to who knows where. But speaking of things I will lose my mind over when leveraged properly, we get a scene of them all sitting around a... single lantern. Damn, that's one deep lantern, I'm telling you. But yeah, all of these real talks around the campfire scenes always hit really hard, and this is most certainly not an exception. Naturally, Armin's mind is constantly replaying what happened with Jean. Though when we see through Jean's point of view, we clearly see that the woman too, seem to be hesitating. The terrifying question in Jean's mind is that perhaps she was never even going to pull the trigger. Clearly trying to protect his friend, he doesn't mention it, but I think that worry is there. But before Armin could begin to entertain thoughts about how she must have been a nice and caring person and whatnot, Levi blatantly cuts them off and gives another perspective very bluntly telling him, it's because she hesitated. Your hands are forever tainted and you will never be the same. Embrace it. If you hesitated, Jean would be dead. For Levi, the implication is obvious. 
there is a good reason why his OVA is called No Regrets. The reason why Levi is a force to be reckoned with is exactly because he is 100% decisive. Just like we talked about at the top of the episode, his mission was to protect Aaron and Historia. So even as he is being chased down by a dozen MPs, he will cleave through anything and everything that stands in his way with no regrets. Though in the wider story of Attack on Titan, there is of course a conversation to be had around whether or not she was truly going to harm Jean or Armin. On the face of it, I mean, obviously, the MPs were blasting left, right and center, and absolutely no one should feel bad for them when they get bonked back. Like, in that sense, it really is pretty cut and dry. But at the same time, we don't know how she ended up in this position. Levi himself started as a robber in the underground, and is now one of the most respected scouts. Perhaps for her, this was merely a means of getting by, and she simply got caught up in something that is way over her head. We'll obviously never know what the truth is, but regardless, it is still a tragedy on all fronts. The scene of her not hesitating with the weapon but her face quivering is not an accident. Clearly, there was emotion there, this wasn't just I'm going to shoot you on sight. So yes, Attack on Titan, as per usual, very depressing. But Levi's final line here is what cuts really deep. With him saying, it's only because you bloodied your hands that no one on our team ended up dead. Thank you. It's that stone cold and blunt realism that just makes it hit so so hard. I mean of course, the whole I will first beat you down and then drop the most empathetic and meaningful line is not exactly rare in stories. But this one I think is just perfectly executed in my opinion. Also side note, Mikasa wanting to pipe up and tell Levi to shut up is super wholesome because clearly she has lived through that herself and just wants Armin to feel better. And speaking of very uncertain morals, as the strings version of Call Your Name kicks in, Jean too begins questioning what they're doing. But Levi again fires back saying, Wait, I never said this is right or wrong. I've got no idea who's right or wrong. Which number one is of course exactly what all of Attack on Titan is about and is the same sentiment we've heard from Levi with Aaron's transformation back in season one. But number two, I think this also rings very, very true for real-world discourse. Since we're talking about anime and animation, let us go straight for the spicy one. AI. I think it will absolutely be used in animation in the very near future to the nth degree and claiming otherwise is just naive. I also think that in the short term, many people will be made redundant by said implementation of AI. Now, let's return to Levi. Him acknowledging what they did does not mean he endorses it at all. He's not making any moral judgement whatsoever. He simply says that, with the information they had, Armin saved them, plain and simple. It is a dark and bitter truth, but to him, it is the truth. Jean is the one assuming moral judgements, whereas Levi never made one. So with what I just said about the very spicy AI, I never gave any sort of judgement on it, and I think jumping to these perspectives of morality and such often muddies these conversations that are not at all about any sort of judgements. That's of course not to say that those conversations too shouldn't be had, but just that jumping to these assumptions doesn't help anyone. And Levi just makes it painfully clear that there's a good chance we might be in the wrong, maybe we're right, I don't know. With a lot of these very polarizing topics, I feel like people just have this tendency to insert their own thoughts into what the other person is saying even though they never said that. With a lot of these things, it feels like they're almost sleeper agent-like phrases that people immediately take personally. But okay, weird tangents about our fractured society aside, Levi then stands up and goes to chat to their newest buddy, whom both he and Mikasa already know. Which by the way, really cool that some seemingly random merchant turns out to be super important later on. But yes, he just says that, oh I'm just a merchant and that if I don't do what the MPs want, they'll just wipe me out like the rest. Though Levi fires back asking, then why don't you fight back? This I think continues that trend that we started with Nick and flipping those stereotypes upside down. In season one, Nick was babbling about the sanctity of the walls and generally spouting nonsense. Though as we get to hear more of his story, we learn that underneath all of that, well, nonsense, there is a lot of very, very dangerous truth and he himself is far more intelligent than he lets on. And the same goes for this merchant. Originally, he is your typical caricature of an evil merchant not giving a second thought to human life so long as he profits. Here on the other hand, while that greed is still what drives him, we see that human side of him, with Levi effectively just giving him a better deal. He's not evil for the sake of being evil and he's not Mr. Krabs. He's got his own interests and motivations and responds to rational arguments. So again, just a nice bit of characterization that has nothing to do with our protagonists. So with that, they team up. We then cut on over to Hanji who catches Erwin up on what Aaron said. Again, we don't know exactly how much of the conversation he actually transcribed, 
but the part that's focused on the most is Amir's words about having to eat a shifter, with Hanji quickly coming to the conclusion that Eren might be eaten. As of right now, we of course don't know the intricacies of why and how, but considering he has demonstrated the ability to literally control titans, and multiple times has been referred to as that thing or that power or even the coordinates, clearly there is more to him that we are still yet to uncover, that of course being the founding titan. Practically speaking, it just gives the story a sense of urgency, with there now being a very clear timer until Eren becomes someone's dinner. As for the MPs though, with the merchant now working alongside Levi and the scouts, they pull another switcheroo and we get gel for our own enhanced interrogation. Speaking of, we jump on over to Levi doing just that, basically just prodding for any information regarding Eren and Astoria. And once again, we return to the same question of morality and what's going too far. With the rest of their squad, all sitting around the table and just talking about how all of this is making them sick. Also, note how Mikasa is the only one standing, perhaps telling us that she is not only disgusted but also restless over Aaron still being missing and in danger. Though Armin then bluntly says, all of us are criminals. Maybe we just did all of this because they're a part of a different group. Yes, I will keep shamelessly reusing this meme because it's not even a meme and Armin literally says it himself. Yoinking a dude's nails in the name of good and the truth is still yoinking a dude's nails, you know? Though we then cut back to Jell, Levi, and Hanji where we get another perspective. With Jell saying, the reason why there hasn't been a war within the walls is because we maintain peace. Hiding your head in the sand and just pretending like there isn't an external force trying to literally wipe out Paradis clearly isn't a viable solution, right? But you also can't really argue that there has been peace inside of the walls, despite the walls falling. Clearly, things like sending out barely trained people to quote-unquote reclaim Maria was effectively culling the population. But it did maintain peace and no civil wars ever broke out despite the impossible pressure. Of course, correlation is not causation, so on the flip side again, he then starts listing off people who they had silenced. First naming the teacher who was apparently too smart for his own good, that of course being Erwin's dad. Then noting the couple who wanted to fly who, by the way, are apparently Armin's parents. Yes, I just found this out myself. And it may also be a nod to the Mikasa OVA where they too wanted to fly with the hot air balloon. But yeah, regarding the Armin point, we only ever really hear about his grandpa and how he died when he was sent to reclaim the wall. His parents, on the other hand, are never mentioned. So perhaps a part of Armin's drive to explore beyond the walls was a hope that they are still alive somewhere. I keep telling you, on every single Attack on Titan rewatch, you will learn something new. I guess I now know what happened to Armin's parents. And there's also Astoria's mom, by the way. But point is, they did a lot of very, very bad things and peace was sort of there. Was it the right thing to do? Well, in hindsight, we can sort of say that no. Because if they kept on doing this and again just hiding their head in the sand, well, sooner or later, parody would have just been wiped out by Marley. But on the flip side again, hindsight's 2020 and Jell is merely a cog in the system. He doesn't know the secrets of the walls. He genuinely thinks that they are maintaining peace. Hanji and Levi clearly aren't happy about doing this either. Both sides right now are doing very, very bad things for what they believe to be the right side. We can sit here and say, well, Jell should have questioned, what am I even working for? But speaking realistically and historically, how many people have you heard of who actually speak up against the higher power? There's a very good reason why reading history books will often make you pull your hair out. A lot of the very, very bad things that have happened is merely a result of people being afraid to speak out. But okay, all moral quandaries aside, much like I mentioned with the throne room, this is just further explaining why the truth hasn't been uncovered thus far. It's not that people didn't try, it's just that there was a force deliberately working against them. The final scenes of this episode is just throwing gasoline on the fire and again establishing that urgency. Big brains Hanji and Levi bait Jell into revealing what he knows. So they now learn that Historia is the rightful heir to the throne. Which, like we talked about last time, with or without fantasy shenanigans, pretty clearly explains why she's important. In Attack on Titan, it is the founding Titan's power. In the real world, that is a whole bunch of succession problems just waiting to happen. So naturally, she has a big old target on her back. And also also, even right up until the very end, the concept of this one true royal bloodline has been a sticking point for many many people. For the sake of time, and because there is no concrete explanation, I will address all of that later on. But really quickly, I think there are a number of different explanations to sort of make it fit. Everything from some not-so-pleasant Lannister shenanigans, if you know you know, to body-altering with the Founding Titan itself, to the dilution of that royal bloodline, I think are all potential explanations. My point being that, yes, technically all Eldians stem from Amir, 
But in the real world, population growth is also extremely exponential, so if you zoom out, I mean, yeah, we're probably going to stem from like a handful of people as well. Again, there is no concrete explanation, but I think there are interpretations that just make it fit a little bit better. For now though, let's not open that can of worms. And one of the final scenes we get in this one is of course Kenny yoinking Reeves for his betrayal of the MPs. We'll touch on this plenty more throughout the arc, but this marks a huge turning point in the conflict between the Scouts and the Crown, with a well-known and entirely independent person now being caught in the crossfire. Remember that Erwin's goal is not a power grab, it's to expose the truth. So when random bodies start littering the streets, well, the public opinion may begin to sway. Plenty more on that next time. Though the episode is not quite over just yet, because we also get a new ED. Much like with the season 2 one, I think this one has that odd sense of immature creepiness to it that I don't really have the vocabulary to describe, but I think when you hear it, you really get what I mean. On a similar note, the lyrics of this one, again, just like the season 2 one, are all kinds of creepy and bizarre and also very foreshadowy. Lines like, why did the earth and sky separate, this world is so beautiful yet so cruel, I think refers to the final chapters titled, The Battle of Heaven and Earth, and of course Mikas' words of, this world is cruel but also so beautiful. Also big picture wise, this one is notorious for the many many Istori and Amir parallels that I think have a number of different interpretations. The first and most obvious one is paralleling and later mirroring the story of a slave and the story of a royal. Regardless of their status, both lived pretty terrible lives filled with tragedy and trauma. And of course in the long run with Historia marrying that farm boy, it completes that mirroring through breaking down those perceptions of status and royalty. The reason why Historia's rule was successful is because she came from the same exact place that Amir did. She understood her people and instead of using them as a war machine as King Fritz did, she instead strived for peace. Much like the title of Requiem of the Dawn suggests, after the rumbling and the unspeakable horrors and death that she saw, she brought upon a new dawn. Speaking of, Requiem is, number one, one of my favorite words just because it sounds super ominous, but two, it's supposed to be an honorary mass for the dead. In Historia's case, I think that is both the rumbling as a whole and of course Emir. So Historia being plunged into that darkness and just trying to reach out for Emir just captures that inner turmoil she's going through really really well. Also, now that we know of the Stockholm Syndrome that the true Emir was experiencing in her love for King Fritz, we have another parallel to Historia never getting that true love with the fake Emir, with us even getting this focus on her as we get the line of, which side is really the one shouting from inside the cage, that is then immediately preceded by her hand passing right through Emir's. As there was no real love between Fritz and Amir, there is no love between Historia and Amir. Slave or queen, their fates are largely the same. Also, the lines about dedicating their hearts to the twilight are just super depressing considering where their stories go. Just like with Red Swan and their now bloodstained wings, this is another noble goal that turns out to be actually quite horrific. To jump ahead, it's that line of, your dream, did it satisfy or terrify? The basement was supposed to have the answers, and while it held unimaginable truths, they could rather be likened to horrors. We reached the sea, but that was not the end, that was merely the beginning. We dedicated our hearts, but we were plunged into an endless twilight. The dream of the sea turned into a nightmare of the rumbling. I think the line of, at the end of the night, is paradise found, captures that very well. It just blatantly asks, was all of this even worth it? And if you want to get extremely dark for a moment, and I really mean it this time, if we return to that line about which side is actually in a cage and the shot of a mirror, I think you could even interpret it as a question of surviving. They have fought so hard all this time to merely survive and to learn of the truth. But perhaps Emir is actually the one who was already set free. Again, for Eren, that dream of the sea, it was a nightmare. We also get the shot of a drop of blood falling upon flowers, which brings us full circle to the opening of the season. This time, however, it's not just memories. This time, they are bloodstained. Which, big surprise, just so happens to be the chorus of Requiem, Requiem. So yes, both for Historia and Emir and Eren, all of these memories are very much bloodstained. Also, 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 this shot of Historia just running among the flowers feels like one of those existential horror manga panels of, like, the eclipse or something that has somehow been captured in animation. I don't even know how to describe it, but it's just perfect. It seems surreal in the best way possible. Another Emir pseudo-parallel is, well, the founding titan Frida, with the ED pretty blatantly showing us how Historia's memories were wiped. Notice the smash cut from that rudimentary hand-drawn art style where Historia is a kid, a part of her story that we haven't seen yet by the way, to her in the present day with just regular animation, but Frida is nowhere to be seen. 
that transition of the art styles is her memories being wiped. And finally, I think this also depicts their lost childhoods, if you will. The true Emir we finally see in the series finale is the adult Emir, and the same goes for Astoria. Young Astoria was lost and plunged into the depths of despair. She ran and ran with no goal in sight. But in the end, many, many years later, she achieved at least some form of happiness. Kinda sorta what we'd also see with Amir, but in both of their cases, it's like we don't really know how much there was really happiness. Like I've said before, these things are so incredibly dense that I will definitely at some point create a focused video on just the OPs and EDs, and will of course continue to touch on them in the context of the episodes. But this one is absolutely one of my favorites, mostly just because of how unsettling it is. Like the chorus of Requiem Requiem is... I don't even know, it's just creepy. That said, that is yet another standalone video on episode 39. Definitely seems like solo videos and longer ones at that will be the norm moving forward. All that said, next time we'll be jumping headfirst into a many-o flashback and many-o politics, so I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. If you allow me to share some future memories with you, the next video is an absolute doozy. I'm also experimenting with a few visuals here and there, so I hope you're excited for that. Also, also, for the One Piece fans among you, if you're watching this on the day of release, tomorrow I'm streaming the Big Chapter 1100 release. And if you happen to miss that, it'll be up shortly on the second channel linked in the description. People tell me I'm horrible at advertising my own stuff, so there it is, I guess. Anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Hannah Hedges, Patricio Lorifis, Anthony Go, and Lukey Dukey. I am sorry if I butchered the names, I most certainly did, but without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.